It is Friday, October 29th. Let's talk PlayStation. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, this past week was definitely the most busy that we've had so far since the PS Showcase. It's been pretty slow since then, which, you know, that's understandable. But uh, now we have a state of play and also Sony's Q2 2021 financial report to go over. So we'll be talking about all that. But first up, as always... Our PS Plus reminder, the October games, grab them before they go away. November 2nd, it's going to change over to First Class Trouble on PS4 and PS5, Knockout City, PS4 and PS5, so two native PS5 benefits. Uh, also Kingdoms of Amalur, Re-Reckoning on PS4, and then also we have three bonus PSVR titles, The Persistence, The Walking Dead Saints and Sinners, and also Until You Fall. So, not too bad of a month. Obviously, it's not going to apply to a lot of you with the uh, the VR stuff. However, I'm pretty sure the Persistence should be playable in 2D. I don't see any reason why not, because that game is still one SKU. So while it did launch as a VR title, it eventually got 2D support as one SKU. So in theory, when you boot that game up, you should be able to play it no problem without PSVR. Um, yeah, and First Class Trouble we saw during the State of Play, that's another social deduction game. I think that launched on Steam or Early Access Steam a few years back, one or two years ago. Uh, but much like Among Us, probably best played with a close group of friends, which, you know, that applies to most multiplayer games. And if you don't care about those, then this and Knockout City are going to be a complete write-off to you. We have had a lot of uh, multiplayer focus games on PS Plus, but, you know, always claim what you're entitled to. If you have a PS Plus membership, always claim everything, even the uh, the VR titles. You never know what's going to change for you in the future uh, or these titles getting an update for 2D or, or what have you. Always claim everything. And I think this is a good month. Um, we've had a lot worse. Let's just, let's put it that way. So solid month for November. Now, moving on to our first news story, Sony recently announced a brand new community-focused event called Seize the Throne, and this is like what we've seen before where it's pretty simple. You can sign up on PlayStation.com and start participating, which, you know, that looks like what you've been doing already, which is playing games, more or less. Um, so November 2nd, it starts and it runs to November 16th. That's the bulk of the event and simple actions like playing games, uh, playing games with friends, earning trophies, I think also taking a screenshot. Those all have assigned point values that contribute to a community pool. Once certain milestones are met, certain rewards are unlocked. Stage 1 has uh, two PSN avatars, Stage 2 has five, and then Stage 3 has three more avatars and a PS4 theme, which, you know, at that point it's getting kind of a... Uh, irrelevant as more people are buying ps5s but that's what you'll unlock and then november 17th what they're doing is three skill-based questions that they'll deliver to you and the closest answer to each three are eligible for grand prizes where question three is a pulse 3d wireless headset and a hundred dollar psn gift card 35 available one per country uh, question two is a king's playstation shapes ring set only three available, one per SIE region. So this, I think, is actually what you want to get. Uh, question one is the PlayStation 5. You know, that's whatever, right? Uh, 35 available, one per country. You want those uh, shape rings for sure. I mean, only three available? Come on, that's a, that's a real commodity there. That's something that you want to hold on to for dear life and then possibly resell on eBay for whoever is willing to pay an obscene amount of money for them. Or you just hang on to them. Or you just don't get them because there's only three available. Um, yeah, we've seen this stuff before. Just sign up if you want to actually uh, be eligible for any of this stuff because you're going to be playing games anyway. Uh, next up, Apple Music. Do you remember how we talked about how that application showed up by mistake on somebody's PS5 on Reddit and they tried to start it, it didn't work, and we thought, okay, sounds like it's coming. It is, it's official. Apple Music is now available on PS5. Only PS5, not PS4. So when that Reddit user tried to start the game, or start that app on PS5, it said that it was only playable on a PS4. So now that it's real, not on PS4, uh, but on PS5, you can sign in, start listening to music while you're playing your games. Also, Apple Music has music videos, which you can watch and then minimize that. The music will keep playing. You can go do something else on PS5 when you return to the app. Uh, the music video will be left where it was while the music was still playing, so that's pretty cool. Um, so if you are a subscriber, that's news for you. And, you know, for many others, they're waiting for uh, YouTube Music and, well, a lot of other apps as well. I would like to have Slang uh, on PlayStation, which I think that's tied up in some sort of deal because it's only on Xbox right now, and also uh, I'll either watch it there or it's also on desktop, and that's usually where I, I go back and forth there if I ever do watch TV, which not much, but um, I would like to have that, and uh, while well, there's a lot of other services. Uh, next up, Housemarque's Returnal recently saw a pretty big update. Uh, the 2.0 update is what they're calling it, and this one does include the much-requested, highly-needed, 
And yes, it should have been there from day one feature, the suspend cycle feature. So you can finally stop playing in the middle of a run, shut the game down completely, turn your PS5 off, and when you boot it back up, you will be exactly where you left off. Now, there are some limitations to that. Returnal is a roguelite, so inherently you're not meant to save in the traditional sense, but how this works is that you cannot save during boss battles, cutscenes, um, the first person house sequences, which I'm not sure why for that, because they're not really, you're not doing anything there. Uh, but more importantly, you cannot save during intense combat situations. So that could be, you know, a locked room, things shooting at you, you know, whatever's happening, it's really popping off. Like you can't save during that, um, should go without saying. But if nothing's really happening, if you're in a safe room, um, that's where you can stop playing. So you bring up the menu, hit suspend cycle, and on that black screen, that's where you can safely shut down Returnal. And you do have to do it on that black screen. You have to commit to it there. If you back out, then you just deleted that save point, right? Because you can't play Returnal in, in the way where it's like keep going save keep going because when you die it's not going to bring you back anywhere so you do have to quit on that black screen uh, however what i did validate and learn and the way they phrased this on the ps blog it didn't sound like this was possible but well i guess there was really no other way to avoid it but yes you could in theory um save scum with ps plus cloud save so you would uh suspend the game uh close it down upload your cloud save turn off auto upload because you're obviously going to be worried about that in this situation keep playing if you die um, download your cloud save overwrite your console storage and yep you'll be right back where you were so in theory you could do that i don't recommend it if you die take the l i like the you know intensity of the the moment and you know the high stakes uh gameplay that they're going for that's how i recommend playing it but i do understand people's frustrations because the game does take quite a while with you know certain runs taking two and a half three hours that's your prerogative, um, but I recommend playing it the way that um, Housemark intends, where it's high stakes and, uh, you know, very challenging. Uh, but the most important thing that I did find out, too, and I didn't test this a lot of times, but yes, the game does also know uh, the difference between a normal suspend state and, let's say, an improper shutdown of your PS5. So uh, if you do have a power outage or something, or if you're in the middle of playing it, maybe somebody trips on, you know, a wire or something, whatever happens, uh, the game does recognize the difference between those two. So I'm not sure to the extent of how it works, um, but it seems like the game does recognize in some way that uh, if the PS5 suddenly turns off and assuming, you know, the console isn't bricked, which in all honesty is going to be a rare circumstance, um, but if it happens to you and you boot up your console and you get all those warning messages, and then uh, start up Returnal. I was returned to where I was for my last suspend point, so I'm not sure in terms of the game crashing. Maybe it will recognize that as well. I can't validate that or force it to crash, but um, for right now at least, I can confirm that improper shutdowns should um, protect you in some way. Uh, also part of the 2.0 update is a photo mode, and that works as you'd expect, and Returnal certainly has its uh, oddly beautiful moments with all the you know, like the laser light shows going on and whatnot but the environments itself are really creepy and weird and i think there's a lot of cool pictures that could be taken there uh, but that's it so 2.0 no new content which some people it sounded like they were expecting that no new content right now at least but for many of you i know that's what you were waiting for was the suspend cycle feature it's here finally and this is still my personal game of the year i think absolutely the game is worth trying at least a few times uh, now, like I said, Returnal is my personal game of the year, and it turns out, which I wasn't expecting the game would win many awards, and that remains to be seen across multiple publications, but at least for the first one that we're hearing about, the Develop Brighton, Develop Star Awards, it turns out that Returnal won game of the year, um, which their award system, it works, like, they're a bit offset, right? They consider games going back to 2020, like November and December, um, which is why Miles Morales won Best Audio and also Sumo Digital for their work on Sackboy Big Adventure. They won Best Studio and I think something else. Um, but, you know, they have a lot of categories. It's just that for Game of the Year, Returnal did win. And that is just awesome to hear. Uh, I do think it's fair to say that for this last year, um, there's not really one clear-cut winner. There's kind of a, a conversation going between a lot of games, or at least more than we than we typically see, right? Almost every year, there's always 
one to three usual suspects of like, oh yeah, this is probably gonna be game of the year and it's really split between one or two games, three at the most. Uh, but this year, not so much. So maybe Returnal has a better shot, which um, that would be great. I mean, I'm just so happy for Housemark. I mean, <laughs> I've said it before, but like, I'm just so, th I'm so thrilled with like their complete U-turn of the top-down arcade action, transitioning successfully to, you know, the 3D arcade action, uh, having a narrative in their games now, having financial backing from Sony, being acquired, just uh, really, I'm so glad that they, uh, they're in a much better position now than they were, let's say, five, ten years ago, right? It's just, I'm so thrilled for Housemark. so congratulations to the team. Moving on to our next news story, there was a recent job listing at Guerrilla Games for a co-dev producer, and if it is to be believed, which it should because it's clearly a real job listing, it looks like uh, Guerrilla Games is indeed looking forward to possibly using the Horizon IP outside of the, the mainline series that's produced at Guerrilla Games. So this job listing says, and I quote, in this role, you'll be part of a specialized group overseeing externally produced game projects. You will function as an integral extension of both the internal and external development team, managing expectations, setting up reviews, and constantly looking for opportunities to improve efficiency, introduce new ideas in evolved production and reporting techniques. You will look at projects holistically and monitor project progress across all disciplines, report on progress and flag risks. In addition, you will be working with the publishing side to plan the go-to market strategy. So clearly, and perhaps unsurprisingly, we should be expecting more Horizon outside of the mainline series of games done by Guerrilla Games. And, uh, well, for a while there, we had a rumor about a Horizon VR spinoff title done by Fire Sprite, which Fire Sprite is now under the PlayStation Studios umbrella. And this job description would technically still apply to them, right? Because it's not a corporate job at Sony Interactive Entertainment, uh, where the word external would apply to outside of PS Studios. It's from Guerrilla Games, so the word external to them means outside of Guerrilla, so it could apply to uh, possibly Fire Sprite or really anything, right? It doesn't have to be the VR game, but it could be um, maybe a mobile title because we know PlayStation's going to be doing mobile games eventually and leveraging IP there, or... Um, we also had a rumor that was more recent about, um, you know, them doing a multiplayer co-op type mode that they wanted to do for the first game, then the second game, and now we know that it's not going to be in the second game. So whether that's a, a free update like Ghost of Tsushima got later in the game's life cycle, uh, saved for Horizon 3, or maybe a separate game entirely, there's a lot of directions they can go. But the one thing that we can count on confidently is that we are going to be seeing more Horizon for the mainline series, but also uh, separate projects as well. Uh, now, speaking of Horizon, we can also bring up the recent PlayStation blog post uh, where the community lead over at Guerrilla Games filled us in on some new details about Horizon Forbidden West, and we learned some pretty cool stuff in there, like the DualSense support. We know the game is going to support DualSense features, but it sounds like they're really going all in, kind of like Astro's Playroom, where every little action does something, so whether it's like, you know, rustling through grass or whatever, you can feel something, or grabbing on rocks, and if you've played Astro, you can maybe get a sense of how that would feel. Um, one other way they described it was when you pull back an arrow, that's kind of expected that you'll feel tension there as a lot of games have done that already. But they mentioned how when you run out of arrows, you actually won't feel any tension at all. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if any other games have done that. Um, cause as far as I can remember, no game does that where if you're out of arrows, the tension is completely gone. Um, but that would work. Um, also they touched on traversal, how, you know, obviously the first trailer, the first gameplay trailer, we saw a lot of that and they elaborated further about how that's really important and giving players uh, more choice, which when you look back at the first game, that very much is an experience that's quite rigid in terms of how you can climb up a mountain or how you can get to a certain area. There's usually only one or two ways where you can go about doing it. And if you do it in an unconventional way, that's Aloy kind of, you know, working against a slope and it just doesn't really look right. Now, maybe you can get to the top, but it just doesn't work that well. Um, but of course, we we now have the pull caster, so there's a lot more, you know, getting to an area very quickly, and there's going to be a number of ways in terms of how you can actually accomplish that. Uh, maybe you might see something that you want to grab. The pull caster can also pull it, and that also goes into the uh, destructible environments. So the way they're describing it seems like it might not be as scripted as one might think and that's always like a little bit nerve-wracking watching some of these gameplay trailers where inherently they're going to be dressed up in a very pretty way where it just looks so fun and it seems like you can you can do so much but once you play the game there's not nearly as much uh, opportunity to do those things as you would have thought so maybe there's a lot more of it in there than we're than we're led to believe uh, they also dived into the topic of how there's going to be machines and enemies 
like standard human enemies fighting together, which is not something you typically saw in the first game, where they're both actively working against you. Um, and we did see a little bit of that in the gameplay trailer with the mounted uh, Tremor Tusk, but there's probably gonna be a lot more of that going on. Um, also in terms of the skill tree, it's back. Certain weapons are back, but of course there's new ones as well. And they wanna allow more choice when you're in combat scenarios. So it seems like they're really addressing many problems and criticisms from the first game. And I'm sure a lot of this also is a matter of they were remnants from the first game that they wanted to include, but they had to cut for one reason or another, you know, time, budget, resources. Um, that stuff always gets in the way. Every single video game has some form of, you know, cut content or idea that couldn't make it to the final product. And I'm sure a lot of that is finally being fully realized in Forbidden West. And so far, it's sounding so great. Um, this is one title where it's right around the corner. Same with Gran Turismo 7. Um, that's also a title where Sony's doing a lot more promotion and talking about it, you know, the amount of cars and um, delivery editor. So there's a lot of cool things being shown off in there as well. I'm not sure how many Gran Turismo fans are keeping up with Let's Talk PlayStation. It seems like if you're a diehard GT fan, you're probably getting your news from GT Planet uh, directly. But um, yeah, there's more movement going with Gran Turismo as well. Nothing too revealing from what we're seeing just yet, but the game is also uh, coming March 4th. Uh, maybe it seems far away, but time is passing quicker than you think. Um, there's a lot to play right now, and by the time we get to that first quarter, you are not going to have a shortage of games to play, or at least an option of what kind of games you want to play. Now, let's talk about this Wednesday State of Play. It was announced on Friday last week, uh, right after I uploaded LTPS, so thank you, Sony. Uh, but they did outline what was going to be in it, which was strictly third-party content. Now, at a minimum, I really like that they outline that every single time. Hey, no PS Studios, or hey, there is PS Studios, or no business announcements, or no hardware announcements. Great that they're always doing that. Uh, but still, people were hoping for Final Fantasy or Hogwarts Legacy, and that would have been great, but not really what happened. So if you want a quick recap, here's everything that was announced. Uh, it started with Death Verse Let It Die, which was basically, a, or it's like a follow-up to Let It Die, and that's coming spring 2022 for PS4 and PS5. We are OFK, which is a indie band biopic, I guess, like a biopic you can play coming 2022 for PS4 and PS5 as well. A free content update for Bug Snacks called the Isle of Big Snacks. That's coming early 2022. Free update, new little island. I'm excited about that. Uh, Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach got a new trailer and a release date coming December 16th this year. So not too long for Five Nights at Freddy's fans. Uh, Death Store finally coming to PS4 and PS5. A lot of people really enjoyed that game this year. That's coming November 23rd. Uh, Kart Rider Drifter, a free-to-play kart racer. You can register for the beta now, and that's coming 2022. Uh, King of Fighters 15 got an open beta trailer that'll kick off on November 19th and the 20th, so they detailed uh, both those dates and also the various time zones and whatnot. And then we got a trailer for First Class Trouble, which we already know is a PS Plus benefit, so we talked about that. Uh, we got a new Star Ocean coming, The Divine Force. That's coming 2022 for PS4 and PS5. So if you're a Star Ocean fan, there you go. Although it's not, I don't know, it doesn't look that great. <laughs> new trailer for Little Devil Inside. Um, this was the one where they outlined this prior to the state of play. A lot of people were very excited for this one. I'm certainly interested. Uh, unfortunately, no release date. So one small bummer there. It seems like that game still needs a decent amount of time before they give a reliable release date or release window for that matter. But it should still be coming sometime next year. Or at least you hope so. And... Eh, yeah, not a great state of play. But the thing is, I wouldn't call it great. I wouldn't call it bad or terrible either. And I know that's like a, I feel like I'm in the minority there for sure. But, and I've said this much when it's like, I'm fine watching a sort of neutral showcase every so often. In fact, I'd like it to be maybe more frequent where it's like every month, every two months of like, hey, here's 15, 20 minutes of some cool software coming within the next, you know, three to six months. And I'd be fine with that. No expectation that there's, big stuff coming and if it shows up that would be cool too um but yes this one could have totally been separate ps blog post with you know a youtube trailer a tweet call it a day but it does beg the question of do these games ever get their own showcase where their hands aren't being held by a large marquee you know landmark title do they always need that so do we do more state of plays where there is where there is no expectation or do we do less of them or perhaps none of them and only do major uh, playstation showcases where we know okay we're going to get updates from ps studios um we're going to see some big third-party deals and then also we're going to have some of the uh, the indie stuff in there um smaller third-party games uh the aa space where you know they're mid-tier developed games 
and does it have to be that every time which you can make the argument that yeah maybe it does need to be that every time because there's also more eyes on the smaller games once you know that big stuff is going to be there so it's you know pros and cons but every time you watch that live stream everybody's looking for something out of it and so that's why it's always going to be problematic for some i don't think it was a great live stream this time uh, but I did get something out of it. I got the Bug Snacks content because I love that game. And then also, uh, I'll probably pick up Death's Door. Uh, seems like a lot of people really enjoyed that one. So I'll probably uh, jump into that as well. So not a great show, but yeah, you win some, you lose some. Next up, it looks like PlayStation's PC releases will continue with probably Sackboy Big Adventure. Uh, there was a recent Steam database listing for what appears to be this game. So there was references to Sumo Digital and also Project Marmalade, which that's what this game was originally codenamed. And well, then the Steam database listing was scrubbed with all that info, so it seems like that's probably what's happening. Um, which would, I guess, make sense considering Sony's been doing a lot of PC releases, and so this is just another one where it's probably uh, on the back burner, or at least now it's being worked on. Um, and this would be one of the closest, uh, or it would be the closest release we've had so far when it comes to PC releases uh after the hardware release but you know sackboy is certainly one of those games where and i like said this when the game was revealed during the uh first playstation reveal showcase or whatever the future games event where i'm like a 3d world-esque sackboy like is that really going to do well um something like sackboy could certainly do better with a, a wider audience and i've you know also said like maybe dreams would be uh the perfect use case there as well where it's like let's get dreams over to pc let's get uh destruction all stars uh on ps4 or pc right i mean that's a game where if we're gonna try and like make that something i mean there are certain titles where it's like yeah it's clearly gonna move a lot of units like god of war and then there are other titles where it's like just inherently based on what they are and the audience that they speak to which is going to be much smaller than your spider-man and your god of war those could do uh much better on pc as well and it uh, looks like Sony's finally gearing up to properly start handling PC releases in more of a, a formal way, right? Where since doing PC releases, they've been releasing them under the PlayStation Mobile subsidiary. And now it looks like they finally changed that to PlayStation PC LLC, where they formed this back in April of 2020. And they just now updated their publisher pages to reflect that change. So now PlayStation games are coming from PlayStation PC as a publishing arm, which is really more of a formality. But again, we're going to be seeing more PC stuff. So um, you know, down the road, who knows exactly what that's going to end up looking like if they maybe do their own launcher or perhaps do more acquisitions of developers that are well known for contract work because right now it's kind of split between all three where uh, Bend did one in-house. We know that God of War and like Horizon are being handled outside of PS Studios, right? So they're just contracting that out. Uh, Sumo Digital, if it is to be believed, then they're just doing their own game, but they're also an external studio at heart, but they're just working on a uh, first party IP, but there's a lot of ways that they can go about doing it, right? The problem with PlayStation PC releases is that they have such a large back catalog of titles. And so if they wanna really start working on those, I mean, there's a lot of um, work to be done. Moving on to our next news story, we finally got Sony's Q2 2021 financial report, and like we've done with previous quarters, we'll just sort of go over a lot of highlights. There's a ton of information in there, but we'll just go over some of the more noteworthy things, like for example, PS5 sales. So they shipped 3.3 million consoles throughout July and September for a lifetime total of 13.4 million. They sold 200,000 PS4s, lifetime total now 116.6 million. 76.4 million PS4 and PS5 games were sold. That's down from 12.8 million last year. Uh, PlayStation made $5.86 billion in revenue, and that's a new record for the second quarter. Any second quarter for PlayStation and I believe other platform holders as well. Uh, software digital ratio this time was 62%. Uh, 104 million monthly active users. That's down from 108 million in the same quarter last year, but that's been kind of fluctuating lately. Uh, same with PS Plus subscribers. Right now they're at 47.2 million. That's still up from last year, but it has leveled off a bit uh, over the last few quarters. It is an increase from 46.3 during Q1. And uh, it was mostly the PS Store and software and services that saw some growth here were both recorded their, uh, their biggest Q2 revenue. And monthly active users are also spending 5.6% more uh, on PSN year over year. 
Uh, more importantly though, forecasts remain unchanged for fiscal year 2021. So it would still mean that if their um, forecasts end up being true, that it would be the biggest uh, year in revenue in video game history, not just for PlayStation, but in history, and also the second best operating profit ever for PlayStation. And we also saw in this report uh, with the Sony Corporation entirely that PlayStation is still the breadwinner, um, making the majority of profit revenue um not by much but it's a large it's still a very large pie when it comes to like you know sony pictures financial services um the image sensors everything else that they do playstation still um has the biggest chunk there like 25 26 percent somewhere around there um for both operating profit and revenue yeah playstation's still doing well uh what's notable is ps4 right where 200,000 in the last uh three months so it's definitely coming to a an extreme crawl there i mentioned this on twitter but it's just strange that it's been here in the u.s for example and i know this is different depending on territory but it's been 299 msrp for years they don't even bother to drop the price of it or uh or try to drop the price in emerging markets where like an, it can have some serious legs like the ps2 like everyone always brings up the ps2 but it's you know, PlayStation 2 was like $100 at the lowest point, and it was, you know, sold for so long. Um, but it's also just due to, to parts and what they can source and, and what that costs and if it's even viable. And also the market changes, right? Where um, right now it seems like, and maybe this is a generalization, but it seems like, you know, nowadays in the technology sector, which games certainly play a, a role in, right? It's a matter of, it seems people nowadays are more eager to, to buy the newest thing, especially with like the smartphone market where there's often deals every single year to jump into the brand new phone that sometimes has an MSRP of, you know, a thousand to thirteen hundred dollars and you don't actually have to put any money down, right? People are always buying the newest thing and they want that with consoles as well. So they're more quick to leave PS4 versus, uh, you know, <laughs> over what 15 years ago where people were not nearly as ready to drop 600 bucks on a playstation 3 and hold on to their ps2s for as long as they possibly could even well into playstation 4 right uh but that's besides the point we've still got another quarter here where they're breaking records left and right again in their own respect right in relation to uh, previous quarters but you can see certain angles of it where there's some seasonality to it and why certain things are leveling off and you can also see examples of where the console market um tends to be a bit static but it's just a matter of extracting more money out of the same users and uh in terms of ps5 sales right now launch aligned with ps4 uh right up to this point it's technically a little bit under like 400,000 something units so technically it is a little bit behind right now but forecasts have remained unchanged so if sony still expects to hit about 22.2 or 22.3 million by march 2022 if you launch a line that with PS4, that's where um, that console was at about 20.2 million. So Sony still expects at some point to have an extra 2 million or so consoles manufactured within that rough same time frame. So they might have more allocation uh, for the upcoming holiday season, which you sort of expect that they want to sell as many as they possibly can during that time, especially because they'll be walking into two very big exclusives uh, for the first quarter of next year. So there might be a little bit of that at play. Assuming everything goes according to plan, PS5 is still outpacing PS4, but really it comes down to just how many of them they can make, and they're, I'm sure they're trying as best as they can to get as many of them out there, but it's still a challenge to actually confidently buy the system with no problems. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. And if you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. Follow the link down below. Support on this channel. A number of ways can gain you an entry, and I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the news stories that I want to talk about to you all from this past week. Our Tuesday video was nothing because I didn't upload anything. Um, so I'm a little bit behind. Still working on uh, the trophy challenge, the next one, which um, it'll be a while until I get that edited, and I'm still actually doing it right now. So that's going to be further away um, than you would expect, but um, that's what I got going on so far, and that's it really. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.